Bonjour tout le monde et j'espère que vous allez bien aujourd'hui. I'm Guy Laforêt, I'm President of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, et je suis très heureux de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour la dernière de la série Voir Grand, Big Thinking du Congrès Ryerson 2017 de la Fédération des sciences humaines. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And this has been the spirit of Congress 2017 at Ryerson. À la Fédération, on est extrêmement heureux du travail que nous avons fait pendant cette semaine avec les partenaires de Ryerson, et on espère que cela sera l'exemple pour le Congrès au 21e siècle. J'aimerais signaler avant de commencer que nous avons un service d'interprétation simultanée au moyen de votre téléphone cellulaire. Les détails sont à l'entrée de l'auditorium sur les chevalets près de l'estrade. We'd like to acknowledge the partners that have made possible this series, SHRC, the Humanities and Social Science Research Council of Canada, the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, and Universities Canada. It's thanks to their generosity that we're able to make these events open to the public and for all to enjoy. Obviously and heartfully, I'd like to extend a special thanks to the sponsors of today's Big Thinking Lecture, Ryerson University. As we consider Canada's past and future, prompted by our Congress team of the next 150 on Indigenous lands, the Big Thinking series gives us an opportunity to explore issues that transform, inspire, and challenge us. And I should add, uh, with the help of my friends from Inroads, Who's telling, uh, who are telling us that liberal democracy is under siege, that if we in the humanities and social sciences in Canada and elsewhere don't do things uh, in that kind of international context, maybe we, we don't deserve the, the kind of, uh, uh, of positions that we have. Today, to help us explore critical issues of race justice and movement building, we're delighted to welcome award-winning performance poet and human rights advocate, Aja Monet, who will be starting the session with a performance. We're also very happy to welcome activist and freelance journalist, Desmond Cole, who will be having a conversation with Aja Monet following her performance. I'd now like to invite Kike Leola Roach, Unifor Sam Gindin Chair in Social Justice and Democracy at Ryerson University to introduce Aja and Desmond. Kike. Merci beaucoup, Guy, et c'est un grand plaisir d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui. Welcome, everyone, to Black Joy resistance, revolution, and radical love. Yes. <laughs> we, need some, we need some radical love right about now. But black is deeper than a color or an identity politic. It is a conceptual approach and perspective on engaging with the world. We live in the nuance beyond binary definitions. How do we expand our narratives versus simply sharing them? What is black joy? What is radical love? How has it been used as tools of resistance and methods of those most oppressed? Storytelling, we know, is crucial to healing, and imagination is necessary for change. Poetry, arts, and music have always been at the forefront of any shift in society. So how do we tell those stories and empower imaginations through the black radical tradition? In this big thinking event, we have with us award-winning performance poet and human rights advocate, Aja Monet, for a performance and conversation with radio host, columnist, and activist, Desmond Cole. 
Aja Monet is an internationally established poet, performance poet, singer, songwriter, educator, and human rights active advocate whose work is an in-depth reflection of emotional wisdom, skill, and activism. She is the youngest individual to win the New Yorkian Poets Cafe Grand Slam title. And in 2014, she was awarded with the YWCA of the City of, of New York's One to Watch Award for her work in empowering women and eliminating racism. An American of Cuban Jamaican heritage, Monet has performed at world-renowned venues, including the Town Hall Theater, the Apollo Theater, the United Nations in New York City, and the NAACP's Barack Obama inaugural event in Washington, DC. Let's hear it for Aja Monet. Desmond Cole is an activist, author, and award-winning freelance journalist. He writes regularly for many publications, and his work can be found in the Toronto Life, in Walrus, in Now, Ethnic Isle, and he is former, their loss, <laughs> Toronto Star columnist. Yeah, a big loss. Um, Desmond, but we get to hear his voice still in so many other venues. Desmond won the award for Best New Magazine Writer at the 2016 National Magazine Awards, and he is currently working on his first book, a nonfiction exploration of the experiences of black people in Canada. Let's hear it for Desmond Cole. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for that uh, lovely welcome. I felt a lot of love after going through a lot with American Airlines. <laughs> of course, it was American Airlines <laughs> and not Air Canada's fault, but um, I'm going to share two poems with you, um, and hopefully they'll set the tone for our conversation and share a little of what, I've, what I write about. This first poem is called Dark Matter. Don't let anything or anyone snatch you out of happiness, which in all honesty, as opposed to selling something, is gratitude. How many times a day do you say thank you instead of assault at a head? How ready the heart for values that cannot be measured by the dollar or advertisement, which is my master and yours too. In all honesty, had that been something of value, there are no gods in America, unless, of course, your god is green and greedy, complicit and complacent, compliant and easily compromised. It would ease so many in their conscience if I say, money is not the enemy. Yet who are we kidding? Don't we already know enemies aren't real, except perceived threats? So you mean to tell me you worship your heart or your Jesus or your Allah or your Jehovah? Are you sure there isn't something else guiding you each day out the door toward a perceived purpose? And what would you be doing had money no business? New York City tells me one hour of the average human being's life is worth $7.25. And what is $7.25 to a dollar if a dollar is only a piece of paper, which is only a representation of value we don't actually have anything to show for? except what we purchased, which is only the value we give it, except what we give is measured by what we take and call valuable. And where is all this gold, all the gold these banks claim to represent? I wish I could tell you about some kind of inner gold
gold you possess, but I'm still digging for mine, as if I could own what's inside me, as if it's not part of something greater than matter or sight or this English language which limits the agreements we can make together about our existence here together. In 2012, scientists claimed they found the God particle, this question, this troubling missing factor of our weight, our hold, our value. They claim, they claim, and yet we have no evidence except the collision of values. Most of what we know and how we see ourselves is determined by five Western countries, five of which determine value by how well they kill others. And we out here screaming black lives matter as in exists or takes up space as in atoms or molecules as in mass. Ain't there some funny irony there? I'm starting to believe that this is all we value is each other's death more than life. And if life so valuable, how come? How so? It's not lost on me that death is part of life. Some die so others live. But who? Who is doing all the dying exactly at the expense of all this living? And are you really being? This, uh, this next poem is called Black Joy. Um, yeah. Hey, baby. <laughs> I lo love babies. Nothing radical is really going on if a baby's not in the room. <laughs> Joy is the will, is the dimple that has endured, a dance so deep in a dark cheek, a wound without a scar, without a trace, is the humor of hurt, is the hell of being healed. Joy daps death, lives in the grin, singing from the blood, bathes in a smirk, testifies tenderness in a tear, is a smile silhouetted against the face, witnessing the want, is the flower in the grenade, a rose in the concrete, a pirouette beside a barricade. It is the butterfly in the battlefield. It is disarming. Is the swing set in the middle of a gunfight? Is dodging a bullet? Is a hopscotch and double dutch a fierce gaze? The side eye, the shade, the sass, the snap, the head nod? Is the turn up, the swag? Joy is righteous and ratchet. Joy twerks and taps, jooks and jives. Harlem shakes, electric slides, dutty wines. Salsas on twos and rumbas. Joy is rhythm and repetition. Hums and harmony is the blues. Is a song in a cotton field or central bookings or on a crowded subway? Joy is a song anywhere. Joy bees in the trap is a dilla beat in the Middle East is fly is finger licking good is pasteles with black beans or a patty and cocoa bread is fried chicken with barbecue sauce or buffalo sauce or hot sauce or any damn sauce joy <laughs> is a recipe passed on, a language that survives, savory and sweet, toe curling, knocking boots is the fight and the fury, is making love to make up is the glow, is an entire day in a lover's arms, a carton of ice cream and a bed of books, illuminated in the aftermath, is wrinkled lips, a pouted kiss, the shivering hips, the theater of thunder, joy is a story traveling through laughter, a rocking chair on the front lawn, a wind chime in a window, is a barbecue in the backyard, subwoofers in a hoopty, melanin gathered in a room, is the aunt is getting your friends in the club. Joy is all about vibes, is a roof over your head, is clothes on your back, is free 99, is having the rent when it's due or having no rent at all. Joy is no debt, no credit check. Joy is shooting dice in a stairway, is getting a hand in spades or a double six copiku and dominoes, is hoops in a crate, is opening a fire hydrant in the heat. Joy is a six block willy through traffic with no handlebars in the rain. It is the catwalk, it is voguing, it is the coming out. Joy is a crackhead with a dime bag and a dream is a fresh pair of white kicks with the check bottle caps glue beneath dress shoes three dollars in the tank is catching rainwater in a tin cup is a firefly in your palm is buying sunflowers for yourself on a cloudy day is a moon in the sky as if in a school play is your father in the audience joy is skipping school or recess is a screen without static aluminum foil antenna is when the belt buckle snaps or when the switch breaks or your mom just gets too damn tired 
Joy is waving down the ice cream truck as a fresh lineup and a clean doobie is the perfect coil to a curl or a loosen nap and an afro pick. Joy is the gift of gab, is wrapping your ass off, is roasting or wrestling a sibling to tap out, is your mama jokes until it's your mama. It's the first foot out the jail, it's the homecoming, graduation is the step show at the probate. Joy is hugging the self, is what conquers the heart and captures the blame, is the madness of our meaning, the maturity of our memory, the irony of our forgetting. It is a helicopter four days after the hurricane on a roof with no water, no food, is a mother picking her daughter up from foster care, is smoking a joint in a cop car, switching lanes, is food stamps on the first of the month, is no snitching, is loyalty, perseverance, protest, resilience, resistance, is the food after the funeral or the parade, is the blessing, the curse, the call, the response, the prayer, the pulpit, is evidence of things unseen, is the hallelujah, the amen, and the holy ghost, is speaking in tongues, is when the santos say you don't need no cleaning, is genetic heirloom, is the portable promised land, it is the diaspora, it is making it overseas or making it over the Mason-Dixon line, it is family, it is brotherhood, it is sisterhood, it is feeling another's dimple in your face, it is together, it is together, it is together, it is unified on the front lines, our joy will astonish the world because true joy, real joy has always been and will always be justice. Very well. Yeah, we're gonna need some water. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, welcome, first of all. <laughs> um, why is that funny? Um, and thank you so much for sharing. Joy is the gift of gab, is wrapping your ass off. When did you first discover that that was true for you? Um, I mean, I think, like, you know, language, the way I've learned that cult different cultures represent language is language is not just what you say, it's how you say it. And it's the intention behind what you're saying. And I come from a family that's Caribbean, so like the way we speak, it's very animated. Um, you know, my, my, my grandmother, my mother, my aunts, all of them, I grew up with a lot of strong women, even my, and, and my uncle. And they're all very like loud energy, like, you know, and not necessarily loud people, but they just, they, their body, they take up space. They usually, you know, they're very performative and when they're telling you a story, they laugh really loud. There's nothing really, um, and it feels very liberating to watch them, you know, just being full self. And, uh, and I think that even in how they tell a story, somehow so, some of that, maybe we didn't realize when we were young, but that's a part of a tradition that has probably been carried on for years and years and years. And the way that some of the things that we take for granted that we just think, oh, well, we happen to do well, but don't realize why we do them well and what, what historically they have, what role they've played in our, 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 our culture and our identity and you know, our practice as human beings. Um, I feel like storytelling has always been a very integral part of how we remain human and how we, we, we challenge and shift narratives and how we learn compassion and empathy. And, um, you know, I, I may not have gone through everything other people were going through, but I could really feel, depending on how they, well they told the story, I could feel it. You know, I could, under, I, I could almost, uh, I almost felt like I was there. And who's to say I, I wasn't, you know? Um, and so I think, the way we see rapping your ass off is really like, you know, oh, uh, hip hop and, and all those things. But there's a reason why hip hop is the cultural phenomenon that it is for black music, is that part of what we've been able to always do has been to communicate our stories and our truth, you know? And so um, 
what I try to do with young people, I'm like, you could really, you could really not just speak well, but you could communicate your heart in a very good well, like, way. Like sometimes you meet some kids and they're just really charismatic, energetic, really good at speaking and telling and, and like, they could light up a whole room just in how they deal with the space, right? And so part of that is, you know, how do I find ways to get you to see that that is a skill set to put in other spaces that can be used in other ways? That's not just rapping, you know, because that's what black people are applauded to do and, and while everybody else gawks, but how does that become a part of strat strategically how we get free and how we imagine freedom and liberation? I, it sounds like you grew up in a house like mine where, <clears throat> where you know, like, those moments of fascination when you were younger of these adults, your relatives and your kin and their friends sitting around, maybe even standing around, and storytelling and joking and being boisterous and loud and celebrating in that way that you maybe didn't see your, I don't know, for me when I grew up, that, didn't, that atmosphere didn't take place a lot outside of the very few black spaces that we crafted for ourselves. Mm -hmm. That would happen at our house sometimes. Sometimes that would happen in a church basement after a wedding. Sometimes that would happen in those, in those community spaces, family spaces. But that it was so special to me as a kid to get to witness that because I didn't see it in my day to day. Yeah, I think sometimes we, you know, black folks are often, at least in America, I can't speak for here, but I'm sure something about it is universal. We're often apologetic about our presence before we even speak, like just the way we carry our body when we're in spaces that aren't, don't feel like home to us or don't necessarily, we don't feel welcomed. I think you're constantly, you shrink and you try to diminish and you try to like be as contained, as formal, as sterile as the space around you. When in, when, when in oftentimes everything inside you is like not that, be, you know? Um, and that's not for everyone, you know, some people are more, more, this isn't like quintessential how you deal with every black person. I'm just saying, you know, some people are, are more calm and reserved and introvert, introverted, but doesn't mean that they don't have a really in-depth interior world. And I think that that's what storytelling and poetry really explores, which is not necessarily what your performance is or what people see you as, because identity is a performance. We all perform gender, we perform blackness, we perform these ideas of what we think we are. But what poetry really explores is, what is your interior world like? You know, what is that thing that people can't see? And how do we start to communicate that people live lives within their bodies? You know, and that you can't just look at a body and assume you know everything about that body. Mm -hmm. You talk about meeting kids who you know have a gift and wanting to encourage them to use that gift in ways that are gonna get them and their families and their communities free. Can you, can you talk a little bit specifically about Dream Defenders and about the work that you've been doing? Um, yeah, so my, I was invited on a delegation. Well, let's just backtrack. I was living in France for two years with, well, partly in France, partly in Amsterdam. And, I, and I, while I was there, it was like right after I think uh, Occupy had happened, and, or like right during, I think. And I was working with a poet and musician, Saul Williams, and I was just trying to get away from the States because I was just like, this is a bunch of fuckery, so I'm done. And, um, and I remember, you know, there was, I remember hearing while I was abroad at some, some, in some way, I remember hearing about um, Trayvon Martin. And for those of you who don't know, Trayvon Martin was, was killed by George Zimmerman in South Florida, uh, I mean, in Florida. And <clears throat> um, he, you know, was a young boy that had a hoodie and was walking to the store. And this man, George Zimmerman, th thought that he was dangerous or, some, or whatever. He was just black with a hoodie and, and shot him. Um, and so that was the first time you know, I had seen young people take to the streets and to the city, to city hall to like shut down. We, our generation had never seen that before. We heard about it, we heard about civil rights, we heard about all these things. But young people become very complacent. You know, Obama kind of just sedated everybody and, 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 and everybody just thought that, you know, life was great and black people all over the world were just gonna be free through Obama. And what ended up happening was 
you know, this story was so provocative and so compelling that, you know, also there was Troy Davis, there was a few other cases, there was things that were happening in the country that were starting, and we saw Obama really wasn't in the power to really do anything. Um, but he also just didn't, I don't think he was concerned with making, act, taking action or claiming or articulating that there was something wrong. So it was young people, as it always has been, it's always young people who push, um, you know, push our elders and push our communities and push our societies to think forward and to do radical things and to change and to learn from, you know, what, what we should be doing. And so they were the dream defenders. They called themselves the dream defenders. And they shut down City Hall after the verdict had, had happened. And they did all these actions. They, you know, shut down the highways. And it was the first time you ever saw a young group of young black, brown kids. So I remember being abroad hearing about the dream defenders. Fast forward a few years to 2015. Um, I'm doing a lot of work with, just, with New York Justice League. Eric Garner happened. Um, you know, Tamir Rice had happened. There were all these, Akai Gurley, there were all these black people that were being murdered and brutally, brutally uh, you know, displayed on our, on our TV screens and on our, our social media. And at the same time, Ferguson had just taken place. And what happened with Ferguson was, you know, for those of you who don't know, Mike Brown was um, shot and killed by a police officer, and his body was left for hours on end um, in the middle of the street. And part of what we had witnessed was the dehumanizing of black bodies, because the, the, the moment at which you start, get, you start to become used to seeing the brutality of these bodies, right? But what was even more horrifying was that during Ferguson, we saw the militarization of our police in a way that young people had never seen. I mean, you see police officers with SWAT gear and you know, tanks coming into a community, a neighborhood. We're not going to Afghanistan. So what are you, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? You know, not that it makes it right either way, right? War is war and it's problematic. But we never thought as citizens, as you know, American citizens, that we would be treated this way. We knew that we were br brutalized, but we didn't know that it was y'all was going to that degree. And so in that, young people didn't know how to deal with it. So we were getting Ironically, phone calls, tweets, emails, not really phone calls, more tweets and emails and Facebook statuses from folks in Gaza. And the last place we would think we would, we would be getting information from. And they're sitting there trying to help us, Palestinian youth are trying to help black kids in Ferguson respond to militarized state violence, right? How do you deal with tear gas? How do you make homemade uh, you know, remedies for tear gas? And how do you deal with you know, taping up cardboard and all these things to protect your bodies? And these are strategies and tactics, I'm getting chills thinking about it, that they're giving us. And in that, we started to realize, wait, hold up. This struggle against American state violence is not just America. You know, it is an international struggle. And so we had to make connections, and Dream Defenders hosted a delegation uh, because one of their members, Ahmad Abusnad, is Palestinian and he saw the connections between what is happening in Palestine and what is happening here in the States. And he said, you know, state violence is state violence. It's, it doesn't matter what culture you are, it's just the way that the state is functioning and how it's abusing its power is an entry point to have dip these conversations about abuse of power and the brutality against us. So in that, I met Umi Selah was the co-founder of um, the Dream Defenders. We went on a delegation to Palestine, and it was a black solidarity delegation, activists from all off, across the country, BLM founders and BYP, Black Youth Project in Chicago, and folks from LA, Ferguson activists were there. And in that, um, we realized not only the power of you know, our struggle and solidarity in our struggle, but the power of our solidarity and our joy and in our love for one another. Because when we were in Palestine, yes, we saw the horror of state violence on the forefronts of Palestinian people, but we also saw the resilience and the resistance and the joy and how our laughter was the same and how we prepared meals together was the same and how we loved our children was the same and how we imagined futures for our children was the same and how we wanted to create a free state for, for our people was the same. And it didn't matter whether or not we had spoke the same language, but we could recognize these things. And it was in sharing with the artists and with the cultural organizers that we realized, wait, hold up. There's something really 
beautiful happening here that just doesn't happen in, this, in the States. And we met young hip hop artists who were in Palestine. Young, we go to meet Palestinian hip hop artists and the first thing I'm thinking we're gonna meet is a group of young little teenage boys. You know, we see a whole group of 14, 15 year old girls. There's not one boy there. <laughs> and it made me really think, well, wow, hip hop is really hitting these, like they're the, if there's anyone oppressed, it's gonna be them. And they're using this platform, this artistic platform, to speak truth to power because in the state of Israel, there is no freedom of speech for Palestinian people. You know, We don't hear their stories. We don't know. You never hear a Palestinian person talking about Palestine. You hear an Israeli Jewish person talking about Palestine, mm -hmm. oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And so how do we change and shift narratives? And this is things that politicize you, you know what I mean? So this is what Dream Defenders was doing. And when we, when we started to have these conversations, we thought about what should we be doing at home? What could we take from what we learned that we could be doing at home? I moved to Florida, fell in love and all this stuff. It was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and then we started a, a, youth, uh, or, uh, uh, a community studio space called Smoke Signals, me and my partner out of our home, because we don't really have a lot of money. But like you said, the home has always been a safe space for black people and people of color and people who have been oppressed. That's the safest place we got. So used to be the church, but now young people don't really go to church. They don't have the same relationship to the church as the civil rights movement. So where are young people going? Where can young people be free and, and talk about these issues? Not many spaces. Um, so we saw the home as being the space. And that's the work we're doing right now is how do we use arts and culture to help uh, spark some of these difficult conversations so that we can imagine and therein create a new free society. Mm -hmm. Oof. <laughs> Sorry. It's a lot to like say in such a, we don't have much time, so I'm just trying I, to. I'm just, and I've heard some of that. <laughs> Thank you for like listening to me rant. <laughs> You talked, you went into this a little bit when we first met over the phone and talked, and I just thought it's really important to share that. Um, just quickly for, to give you a chance to catch your breath too, like here, what we're seeing is the same thing. Yeah. In Canada, where other people are used to either telling our stories on our behalf or just ignoring our stories, um, what we are going through as black people specifically in this country is not being acknowledged or is being intentionally covered over. And so we are having the same experience where we're being inspired by what we see abroad and then almost using that as fuel to bring it back. I went to Ferguson after Mike Brown was killed and left in the street. I thought it was really important after they acquitted Darren Wilson, the police officer who murdered Mike Brown. I thought it was very important for us as Canadians to get that story, but Black Lives Matter Toronto was actually born in those international protests after Darren Wilson was acquitted. So I'm in a hotel room in Ferguson watching thousands of people here march through the streets, talking not only about Mike Brown, but about people like Jermaine Carby, who was shot and killed. Uh, they claimed he had a knife on him and no knife was found by the investigators at the scene until several hours later. Mm. So, you know, these stories get obscured. And while the whole media focus goes to the United States and says, wow, look at this racism, look at this discrimination and this conflict. It's like stepping over the bodies of the people here who are being killed by our police, mm. who are being handcuffed in our schools by the police as a six-year-old girl from Mississauga was recently. Um, in that context of what we're collectively fighting and this collective struggle against state power, can you talk a little bit about imagination? Because I think it can feel like imagination is a luxury sometimes when you feel like you're constantly under siege that the ability to project beyond survival and beyond what's going on immediately around you is maybe something that people feel like they don't have access to. But I want you to talk about how that's been fueling your work with young people and your own writing. So I'll say, you know, 
I've heard of the things that have, just to kind of follow back on what you're saying, I've heard of the things that have taken place in Canada. And it's not, it's not like, what's interesting to me is how people act brand new to these things. You know, that's what's interesting to me. <laughs> it's should, not necessarily. You should, meet our, you should meet our mayor. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, but I mean, Europe has the same issues. You know, I've been to Europe and people kind of say that, oh, they don't have the same issues. The difference is Europe, you know, America's just a stepchild. Like, mm. you know, really they forget that they're the parents. <laughs> so whatever we are, we're a reflection of you. And Europe, the only difference with Europe was is that they didn't, they, they didn't have to force slavery. They, they went and colonized countries, right? So now they're mad that all these people coming back to them. But re, in reality, you know, their laws were built for the protection of white European status. So they didn't have to make laws to make it difficult for black and brown people in the beginning. That's why they start off sounding really good, this social health care and all these things, because they weren't thinking about black people coming in there right, at the time. They weren't thinking about immigrants coming in there at the time. They were thinking about themselves and protecting their whiteness and protecting their little babies. But that's also a fight. People had to fight for those things, right, because there was poor people fighting against these, like, wealthy, you know, crazy queendoms and kingdoms and stuff, things we don't really talk about. But what I'll say is, you know, oppression is unified, so we must be unified in our effort, efforts to be free. And that's really what it, what it means is that, the, that it doesn't really matter what country you are, what border. We're starting to realize borders don't really mean much no more. You know, it's all about corporations and tech companies now these days. That's what's running things. Those are the countries you got to follow. And if you don't realize that, you, gonna, you know, these politicians ain't got nothing on the CEOs of Google and all these other places. They, they, they follow these people, you know. We have Trump, number 45, in office. And, and, and he's basically a, a business. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is, is that we have to be more unified as a people, you know, as people, not th these whole ideas of, of, of identity. Identity is an entry point. It's not the end of the conversation. What I'll also say is why I talk about blackness as beyond just the color. In Haiti, during the Haitian Revolution, you were considered black so long as you were fighting for the revolution. It did not matter what skin color you had. So when people over here are trying to argue all that, OK, but if you're not willing to risk your life for this, don't come talking to me about what I should or shouldn't be doing. It's the same thing we learned about Palestine, right? Resistance is resistance. If someone has a foot on your neck, it does not matter what you do to take the foot off so long as you're trying to get the foot off. And if you're not helping me to try to get the foot off, you can't talk to me about how I should be trying to get the foot off my neck. And real quick to just go inside with what you were saying about imagination. I'm a woman of color. I'm a black woman. You can't tell me a black woman don't know what it's like to be oppressed and still imagine, OK? to go to bed every night with men who oppress you and still imagine, all right? And that's not just black women. Every woman in here lays beside somebody that essentially oppresses them. For those of us who are in heterosexual relationships, or at the very least, even if you're not in heterosexual relationships, the way patriarchy works these days, it doesn't really matter. We are in a situation where we're constantly learning what love can do to overcome differences, to surpass, to move us forward, to elevate us. I've never seen an imagination more illustrious and incredible than a black woman's imagination. And oftentimes, she's in the worst position of all societies. So you can't tell me just because you're in a dire situation or you're in a, a you know, you're in a state of urgency, yes, it is difficult for us. It doesn't make it so that we don't still imagine. I think that there's a society that has tried to make it seem as if we are powerless, you know, and that, we, that our imagination isn't powerful. But from the time children, it doesn't matter what color you are, from the time children are children, you know, either we're telling them what they should or shouldn't be doing. We aren't telling them, hey, that chair right there, that's a time machine, you know? That's a spaceship, you know? You're not, you're not 
elevating what they can see for themselves. You're just telling them what the world is and how they need to move in the world and how they need to do in the world. So for all of us, we need to be doing better, especially with our young people, because those are really the people that are gonna come up with innovative, imaginative ways to respond to the problems we have as human beings. We have a lot of problems as human beings outside of race and identity, but that is where the, the center of it meets because that's what we use to oppress other people. You know, that's what we use to justify and rationalize our, our capitalistic, self-serving, you know, um, yeah, self-centered self greed, you know? And if, if, if we all felt like we could do more, then I think if we imagine that we could do more, then we would. And I think Canada often gets the, the rep for us in America as being the place that has done a good deal of work to try to make certain values a basic right. Um, and, I, and even though that might not still be where it could be, I'm sure it's not, but we're still arguing with people in America that healthcare is something everybody has the right to. Mm -hmm. You know, that uh, education is something, every, like at the very least, y'all can agree on that. <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, I mean, I know we're gonna take some questions from the audience. I, I, I mean, what I think about when you say that is just that um, healthcare, yes, except if you're a migrant worker from Jamaica or Mexico who comes here to grow and pick our fruit and vegetables, hmm. like then they, you pay into the system and you don't get access to it. And if you get sick, we send you home. If, we get, if you get injured, we send you home and get a new worker from Mexico or Jamaica. So not healthcare for all, certainly not status for all in Canada. We project, we love to talk about y'all because that means we don't have to talk about us. That's our game. And mm. so I know we project, like we got, we give good face here in Canada, <laughs> you know, but there is very little that we agree on that includes the same marginalized group and that doesn't reinforce the same systems of patriarchy, of white supremacy, of militarism, and we're really following in the United States footsteps right now in terms of militarism and not questioning anything that is going on in the era of the 45th president of the United States. But, you know, that is a whole other... I'm sorry all for him, man. I mean, yeah. I ain't America, but... <laughs> I just be feeling bad every time I travel with my passport. I just be like, man, people just be looking at me probably like, dang. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a sad state, but I think it reflects where we are, you know, when, when a real estate developer becomes the head of your country. Thank I think you. it says a lot about where we are as Thank a country. Thank you. Um, so we do have some time for questions. Vous pouvez poser vos questions en anglais ou en français, si vous voulez. Um, feel free to ask a question in English or French. And we have a microphone here. We have a microphone up there at the top of the stairs. We have a little bit of time for some remarks and questions. You, you have a question? Oh. Hello. Hello. Peace, Desmond. Peace, Aja. Um, hi. hi, my name is Addie Stewart, and uh, it's just thank you very much for everything you're doing and spreading and sharing, both of you. Um, there's so much I could say and ask, but if there's one thing that I'd like you to learn your perspective on, Aja, is um, one thing I've actually realized is the, the insane, insidious connection between slavery and sexuality in America and identity and race and how sexuality has been commodified and capitalized and how the idea of black love or just love and sex in general, period, pure exploitation and slavery and it's just a power game. There's very little healthy, holistic, functional love or joy or balance or compassion in modern sexuality, especially in America and thus projected all around the world. Um, so as far as black people are dealing with it in America or places that you travel, uh, oppressed people, like what ideas and what, what inspiring stories and moments have you seen as far as people combating all the oppression, capitalism, sexism, misogyny, patriarchy, 
patriarchal bullshit just in general, just, I mean, be, uh, like, I guess it's a continuation of the imagination idea, but specifically in the realm of sexuality and love, because mm -hmm. I think that is, it's the core <laughs> thing to help heal this life, but it's in such a fucked up place right now that it's lifetimes of work we all gotta do to heal the idea of loving each other as black people or just people in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. And especially, especially in the context of interracial in quote unquote the most multicultural city in the world here in Toronto and how much interracial sexuality is still generations later a fucked up concept in the states after generations of multiracial children it's still a problem there so just what inspiring things might you have to share <laughs> So um, I wrote a piece that, that was called Lo The Love That Develops in a Foxhole, and you can probably find it online. It was after the, the riots in Baltimore, and um, you know a lot of people looking at the way that black people were responding to state violence and calling them thugs and you know even Obama, mm -hmm. who be, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and um, you know, kind of de demonizing this response. And one of the things, arguments that I made in that piece that didn't really get picked up on any real publication, but I put up on myself, was I talk about how love was, if there was anything more visible than, if there was anything more, there was nothing more visible than love in those demonstrations. And that, that love is not exempt of anger or frustration or outrage. That if in fact they did love themselves, I would be ashamed, I would be ashamed if black people were dealing with state violence and they did not come out become outraged. You know, um, part of the, the things that I noticed was like, what is it gonna take? How much are you gonna spit on somebody before a man or a, a man, you know, how much are you gonna mistreat a woman before a man is gonna stand up and say, you ain't mistreating my woman no more, you know? And these are stories that historically I would have to go into so, so deep in America um, the level of, of exploitation of our bodies, the level of exploitation of our love, um, the narratives that they tell about us, you know, the mandingo and all that stuff that, 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 they, that they've been sharing and exploiting, um, the fear around the, the, the black male genitalia, you know, the fear of, of, the, of, the, of the woman, the mammy character, caricatures, the, the idea that somehow we breathe more than everybody else. And then, and then reality, um, you know, all of that is just misconception and narratives that people have been telling uh, about us. So it goes back to what I've been saying is how do we reshape, not just reshape, but expand narrative and tell our stories because this is a new day and age, you know? And it, we ain't dealing to just, we ain't tuning into just your program no more. We got new programs. So instead of fighting to get into your program, I'm done. I'm gonna go get my own program. And all y'all people gonna wanna come to my program anyway. <laughs> Because your program ain't no cool no more. So the reality is, is how do we tell our own stories? Another thing to kind of talk about sexuality and race, you know, James Baldwin always said that that was it. That was where it's at, it's the connection. I'll say something that's gonna make some people uncomfortable. If everybody in here was naked, how would we would determine who has power in the space? If we were just animals, okay? What is it about clothing that is oppressed people's bodies and made it so that we hypersexualize everything, right? And why do we think about that, right? If we all were animals, we was just animals and it's all about just procreation, all this other stuff, right? If we were all walking into a room that's naked, you know, these men that they said was too big were warriors and all this stuff. If Obama, just to give you a really crazy image, I'm sorry. <laughs> if Obama, and Trump were in a room and they were both naked. <laughs> I'm serious. Who would be powerful in that situation? Just off of bodies. How serious could he take himself? How insecure would he feel about himself? Let's be real now. You know, whiteness is afraid of its own body. Mm -hmm. So it keeps, it keeps other people's bodies in check because it can't deal with its own body. So we gotta talk about this now, because then it goes into sexuality, you know? Then it plays into how we see love and how we imagine love. And so if you can't face your own body, don't be telling me what I need to be doing with my body. 
Let's take our clothes off and let's see who's really got power right now. You know? But we could go into that for a long, that's a long thing we could talk about. I'd like to end this off by saying, I'd like to send you some of my goddess worship sexuality because beyond it, my, my work here is not only as a journalist and a teacher and a hip hop artist, but I've been doing sex work in Toronto for three years and that's the realm of politics that I exist on now. My, my, sexual, my sex work name is Malcolm Lovejoy and the first half of it comes from Malcolm X, the second half of it comes from Reverend Lovejoy from The Simpsons. So that sounds that's, awesome. We'll talk about it. That's no, that, that I'm so with you. And just uh, the, my last thought is really like, I thank you for my, very much for saying that because I genuinely believe that sexuality and love is the civil rights of the 21st century. Well, I also want to say love is not sexuality and sexuality is not love. So let's be very clear because when I talk about love that develops in a foxhole, do y'all know what a foxhole is? In the middle of war, they create a ditch and they, you get in the foxhole to protect until the war is over or until battle is done. So what I say is black people are in that foxhole. We all constantly in a foxhole. That's our life. And I wonder, well, what kind of love has to develop in a foxhole if that love can't be in the world and free and expressive? What kind of love develops in a foxhole? And I often say, not to make people feel uncomfortable, because when I talk about white people, I'm really talking about a specific thing. I'm talking about people who, white people are people who function in the world first as I'm white. I'm white, and then I'm a person. People that happen to be white, I'm a person, I happen to be white. It's very different, right? So when I'm talking about white people, I'm talking about people that function with the, with the mentality of white supremacy. They move into spaces and believe everything should revolve around them. And in that, what is it about how white people talk about love, this romantic, you know, da da da, and how black people talk about love, right? And what are the ways that we see that, right? And that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in what do oppressed people, how do oppressed people move and love and, and imagine themselves that has made it so that they are the only ones that truly know what freedom is. You know, because in the middle of America being founded, they trying to talk about the Declaration of Independence, they're enslaving people. You trying to tell me what freedom is and you're enslaving people, you don't know what freedom is. The only person that knows what freedom is is a slave. Really, you know, so, in, in reality, it's kind of the same argument I make about love. We have to do more radical work with our love politics. Love has to become a political technology. And if it does become so, then I think we can, we can get to a place where we address all those other things and how it, how it you know, moves in those other spaces. Thank you so much. I want to give, thank you. I want to give others, if there's yeah. any other <laughs> folks who have a question or want to make a comment. Yes. Obviously a fan favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I love your know. glasses. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing your poetry and your knowledge and your wisdom, both of you. Uh, it's, um, it's a blessing to be here. And I really just want to know, um, like the topics are so incredibly heavy. And I appreciate that we're like, uh, as much as we talk about the sort of like the political realm, um, the ways in which oppression, white supremacy, um, state violence operates, like your insistence on love, on generosity, on like the human spirit. Um, how do you nurture yours? How do you create space for that, um, for that love, for that imagination, for that spirit to develop and grow? Because as we know as black people, you have to get back into that world every day where you have to face that violence. So. If you could share a little bit of that with us. Thank you. I, uh, I love, I'm a lover. I'm a lover. And I, and now I'm not just talking about romantic love. Like, I love, I love, I love. You know, Bell Hooks once talked about how she, she said, everything in your home should love you. Everything. And that means from the way the curtains hang to the way you put your dishes in, in, in the dishwasher to the way, you know, you set your table the way you put your, your towels up in the room. Everything in your, in your home should say, I love you. It should make you feel loved. It should make you feel honored. It should make you feel like you're digni you dignified. If you can't control the world, at the very least, control your space. You know, We, sh we, should, we should celebrate ourselves every day. And, and it's hard. 
It's hard. But you know, there's different practices you have to, just as diligent as oppression is and breaking us down, we have to be as diligent in, in building each other up and creating with one another. Something that brings me joy is giving, is being of service to others, you know? I, I, we do, with Smoke Signals, we do jam sessions in the house, and we invite people from all over, you know, uh, South Florida to come and jam in our backyard, and there's, you know, there's nothing that brings me more joy than, than just being among our people laughing and, and creating and singing and dancing and telling stories and, you know, co coming together, gathering with one another, eating well. I mean, I love food. Food is yeah, just food. the best, you know? <laughs> Take care of yourself, you know? I think it's important, and I don't wanna be like self-care, you know, like, because that's become a, a really weird thing. But I believe, you know, self-care is not just about the self, you know? It's also like, we're humans that are in relationship with each other, and because we're often on social media these days, we have, it's like become socially awkward. Like, you know, we don't know how to deal with people, how to like actually have a conversation and see how you're doing, and not just what do you do, like, what can I get out of you, but also, how are you today? You know, how do you feel? Like, are you okay? Did you have an okay day? Like, these are basic questions that can get someone to start to think about, well, dang, do I feel okay? Did I do all right by myself today? Should I have done this? What did I eat? Did I eat today? Oh, I didn't eat today. Well, you should eat this. You should try this. You know, and that's, these are, it seems so stupid, but we have gotten to a place in our society where those mundane things have become insignificant. And when we don't have those things as value systems, then we lose a, a bit of what our humanity actually is, you know? So I, f I feel like those are things I love to do. I eat, I, I try to celebrate uh, things with, with people. I try to meditate, you know? I travel, um, but it, it, it depends on the day. And it's not always easy. Some days are really depressing because yeah, it's hard out there. But at the very least, wherever you go to lay your head down, it should be a place that loves you. If you don't go home to somewhere that, that love is, is laying there with you, then you should not be going to home to that place. Do everything in your, in your power to make sure at the very least, your home is a place of love. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what about you? I, just go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to add, we're running out of time. Um, I just want to add to that to say that uh, I, I, I think something that's I've been thinking about a lot late, lately is, is the mundane, the so-called mundane, and how it's actually not, Yeah. and how when people see that I've been working a lot and imagine you, know, you must be out of your house a lot, you must be eating out on the road a lot, and somebody says, can I make you dinner and mm. bring it to your house? Mm. And up until the last little while, this would be the kind of thing where I'd be like, nah, thank you. That's so nice of you. That's OK. And now I'm like, bring that food to my house. Hell yeah. <laughs> that's so funny but, you said that. I told my friend the same thing. I was like, "There's it's, and it's only two people that's ever done that for me. Like They just call me Randy. Are you home? Uh, yeah, OK, I'm stopping by. And they don't ask nothing. Mm -hmm. They don't ask nothing. Because sometimes you just also don't want to like extend your energy. You're just like, oh, I've got to talk to them. Da, da, da. But they just come and give you some love. And you're like. I, I, a friend of mine got these like really, really good um, like frozen sticky rice mm. and put them in my freezer without telling me. That's how you know that somebody loves you. <laughs> No, that's real. I like that. Made me almost want to shed a tear. <laughs> <laughs> that's real. <laughs> but that is, in the way that we just need that every day of our lives, that is as revolutionary as the big things that we're all talking about, which often are very reinforcing patriarchy because they have to do with like showing muscular physical force, being out in like a street protest, like shouting down the police right to their face. Like, not everybody wants to or can do that kind of work. And it's not that when we talk about the things that we need to do to liberate ourselves, like, we need to beat each other, right? Well, that's another like, thing, real quick. Organizing has become that. Like, activism have gotten real, a lot of activists have gotten really um, drained from all the direct action stuff. 
And part of that has been like, we're able to go up to the police and yell at them, but we can't even look at our brother and sister and point. say, I love you, or what do you need, or are you okay? Or actually, I got some beef with you we need to talk about. So it's like you're saying, we just need to be doing that work more. And if there's someone who is doing this work, I encourage you to love on them a little more, to give them a little more, to, to ask them what they need. If you know there's someone who's doing this activist or this community organizing service work, just try to find a way to be of service to them. Yeah. Um. Quick, real quick, let's just see what it is. Even if we don't answer it, we'll just see what the question is. Yeah. It's, it's actually, why is this only an hour? <laughs> I know, you know, we have the it's, same question. It's really, um, it's really beautiful, awesome expression. There's so much I would love to say. I'd love to dialogue with you for hours and hours. Um, I just wanted to say, because right now, I, I, for a series of circumstances, I ended up working with the Black Movement in Colombia. There's um, the uh, Afro-Colombian community in Buenaventura in the Pacific Coast is on a 16th day of a civ civic strike in face of racism, discrimination, exclusion, and lack of involvement in the peace process. Um, their, their whole thing is uh, the black community's process starts with joy, happiness, and freedom is what we're here for, right? They've, they've inspired me for 25 years, and now it's the first time historic they're out on the streets, and they, they need people to know about this. There's so many, um, you know, connections to be made with what you're saying in terms of, you know, I, I feel like I, I couldn't not say something because it's, it's the black community up peacefully on the streets, 80,000 people in face in, in a community of 400,000, almost a quarter of the community saying no more. It's the biggest port that's bringing, you know, bringing in community uh, uh, goods, uh, commodities, and the state violence there right now to, in order to make, allow those goods to um, travel, whereas the people on the streets are not allowed um, to travel, so uh, to move, to, to be themselves in their places. The women in um, Buenaventura are facing some of the most brutal violence and they're just absolutely beautiful and inspiring in terms of what they share. So I wanted to put that out there. I tagged Desmond in on, on we'll um, be, we'll, I'll be out there after, so you we'll definitely. Chat, but I just wanted to say thank you. This should be longer. And <laughs> it should. Wait, can you just tell us what your question is up there? Just tell us and then you can. Sure, very quickly. Um, thank you very much. It's uh, terrific to hear your perspectives. Um, I just want to make a comment and then, and then a question. Uh, you know, there we, are we're a lot really, of really questions. Low on time. You can make the Wait. comment with me right out there after. I'll be right out there. Okay. Um, there are a lot of white allies. And uh, one of the things, I, I'm a member of Surge, Stand Up for, for Racial Justice, this sort of thing. And there's also some criticism from the black community um, about, you know, these, these sort of programs. Um, uh, white allies and people trying to uh, get involved. Uh, black people are demanding their own space and this sort of thing, and there is this need for this equity. My question, very briefly, is how can you know white allies um, support black community without uh, very quick, without very quick? I got you an answer. Organize white people. Get check your people. When you see when you see an opportunity to check whiteness, check whiteness. The best way to be an ally is to end the ways in which whiteness functions in relation to trying to save and, and, and protect all other people. The, organize your people. And I, I, I just, I'll just, take, ten, I'll just take 10 quick seconds to add to that, that I was at a political convention this weekend and I talked about white supremacy and I talked about a lot of examples in Canada that are manifestations of white supremacy from historical, historical times onto the present. One of the things I mentioned was the Japanese internment in Canada, which happened for eight years before, during, and after. People don't realize that actually the Japanese internment lasted as twice as long as Canada was, well, it started in 1941, the war ended in 1945, Japanese internment in Canada did not end until 1949, four years after the war was over. A woman came up to me at this political convention in full sight of all of her colleagues and party members after this was over and dared to tell me that it was justified to intern Japanese in Canada. But you know something? One of the men who was standing there listening to her, he said, not only do I disagree with you, but you and I are gonna have a talk in the morning. <laughs> and that's... <laughs> and, 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 Americans were killed trying to stop 
Yes. Hatred. Talk that. Yes. And more, more need to do that. I'm not saying that I want any more death, but if white people don't see the gravity of what we are facing as people of color by at least standing up for, against their own hatred, then they ain't never gonna see it. Yeah. So we need you to stand up against your own hatred. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please, let me thank them, and I have two minutes to do this, so just watch and count on your watches. I'm a 62-year-old white political scientist from Quebec, and I have 120 seconds to use poetry to thank them. So the poet is a German expressionist writing near the end of the First World War, and his name is Georg Trakel, and the name of the poem is Grodeck. And I'll just read one line. All roads lead to bleak decay. No joy whatsoever. One of the reasons why there was no joy for Trakel and the people of his generation is he didn't have the good fortune to have people like Aja Monet, Desmond Cole, and Kikerola. On behalf of the Ryerson team, we'd like to remind everyone to join us for a Tribe Called Red concert on Gold and Victoria tonight at 7 p.m. Jesse Winty will be there to introduce the band. We hope to see you all tonight. Thanks to our sponsors, and merci beaucoup à l'Université Ryerson. Merci.